So thank you all for coming today. Um, by all means, you know, AmCham is very much dedicated to help serve members like you. And they've been around here to do really three key things, to provide high quality resources to help you succeed in China, but also to help support advocacy, and also to provide relationship and educational opportunities like today's event. Now, for those of you I haven't had the pleasure to meet, my name is Han Lin, the chair of the Financial Services Committee. And one of the things that, as you may all be aware, the US-China tensions continue to take headlines in all of the various newspapers. And people often wonder, what is the impact on China? Now, what's often not as emphasized as much are all the reforms, all the challenges that China itself is wrestling with, of which perhaps one of the biggest factors affecting China's economic situation is the deleveraging effort. Basically, looking at aspects of credit. So we're very fortunate enough today to have special speakers from S&P to do a special credit spotlight for us to take a look at China's changing dynamics in the credit space, particularly at the sovereign level, the financial institutions level, and the corporate level. So, Kinan, let's start with you. Thanks a lot. Uh, yes, as introduced, I'm the person in charge of uh, sovereign things across the Asia Pacific region, but more specifically, uh, today I'm here because I'm the primary analyst uh, covering the China sovereign ratings. Um, the news this year hasn't been good. If you bother to read the newspapers or check uh, the district with whoever uh, is doing research on China in the financial institutions, uh, economy is not doing well, stock market is falling quite quickly, and you have uh, investment activity slowing down, you have the RMB depreciating, and there's a trade war brewing. Uh, but from a credit analyst point of view, actually things are looking really good, really good uh, compared to last year especially. Uh, when we downgraded the rating from double A minus to single A plus, indicating that we think the risk of the government defaulting on its debt, however small that might be, has been increasing. Now the reason why we think things um, has improved or looks quite good this year. It's not because we don't care about growth. In fact, if growth were to fall in China from current levels to towards four and a half percent and below, then I think there will be serious concerns. Uh, big serious concerns for us because directly that is going to trigger our assessment that economic support for the economy is slower because slower growth means slower government revenue, larger deficits, more unemployment, more social spending potential political instability. All the bad things uh, that could happen. But short of that really unlikely scenario, uh, we actually think that uh, growth is not such a bad thing if it comes with structural adjustments in a good way. Now, and for the moment, we are seeing that structural adjustments are happening in a way that we think makes the China sovereign rating a safer rating uh, than before. Why? Well, the reason why we were concerned with the China rating and lowered it last year in the first place was because we saw that although growth was very strong, it was to a large extent supported by very heavy public sector investment, which in turn was financed by very rapid growth of debt. Now, how do we see debt as being too high and investment as being too strong? Now, globally, if you do a comparison, China's investment to GDP ratio is about 40, 45 which is extremely high for any economy. I don't think you have too many big economies having this kind of uh, investment rates compared to GDP. And not only is the rate high in the past few years, it's been high for the past 20 years. Uh, which leads us to believe that, hey, if no other economy in the world is sustaining this level of investment, but it is sustained in China for such a long time, either the Chinese have found a magic formula to make all their high investments extremely productive despite the large amounts going in, or it is not sustainable, and therefore at some point it will correct the levels that we commonly see in other countries, which is anywhere between 25 to 35% of GDP, which is about a 10 percentage point correction. Now, if a 10 percentage point correction means much, much, much slower growth, firstly, and secondly, much many more MPLs in the financial system. Uh, which is why we were very, very worried that uh, at some point that uh, if the investment rates were to continue at this rate, then there could be one day a, a hard landing scenario. Now, like I said, 
how uh, we, we don't think that the high investment in China has been going to extremely productive, uh, at least commercially viable kind of investment. Why do we think so? Because we also see that it's largely financed by very heavy growth of, uh, very strong growth of credit. Uh, and for past 10 years at least, uh, the credit growth has been a lot stronger than income growth in China, which worries us a bit because if you keep borrowing a lot more than what you're generating in, in terms of income, your the economy's ability to support this amount of debt, which depends very much on the income that you generate, will one day weaken to an extent that you can no longer control interest rates in, a, in, uh, in China, and that would mean, therefore, financial stress in the financial system. Now, we're not there yet, and we, I don't think we are quite close to that because our rating is still a high level, A+. Uh, but certainly things need to change for the rating to stay where they are because an A plus rating just implies that the government has very strong control over what's happening in the financial system, what's happening in the economy, and therefore make it very, very unlikely that the government will default on its debt. Now, the re things that we have seen this year, despite the lower growth, is that firstly, credit growth has slowed quite, quite substantially. And depending on which measure of credit you look at, uh, in most cases, you will see slowdown. In some cases, you don't. But there are good reasons for that, and there are structural reasons. I think uh, Ryan, who covers the financial institutions, will elaborate a little bit on that. But by most measures, credit growth is slowing down. It's slowing down to a level where we think it is more compatible with the income growth of today. Now, secondly, we also see that despite the slowdown in economic growth, uh, the slowdown in a structural way doesn't seem so bad because. We have seen that much of the reason for the slowdown is attributed to slower investment growth. In fact, the, the figures just announced today show that the fixed asset investment growth, I think on a year-on-year -year basis, is now about 3.3%. Shocking because just a year plus ago, it was like 20 plus percent. And it has been going on at double digit rates for many, many years. Now, why has it fallen so much in such a short time? To a large extent, we believe that it is because policymakers are increasingly concerned about financial stability and the lack of balance in its economic growth structure. And therefore, it is actually policy measures that are dragging down both credit growth and investment growth. Because we see that there remains quite a bit of room in the financial system to continue to grow credit quite as strong as had been before. The only reason why they are not doing it today is mainly because firstly, local governments are prevented from borrowing a lot. And secondly, financial regulators are forcing a lot of financial institutions to limit their new lending. Now, uh, that is all good, and indicators that we're seeing are quite, as of today, quite uh, supportive of credit ratings uh, at the current levels. But uh, obviously, there are concerns, and a big concern today is, of course, um, the US-China uh, trade frictions, which we believe uh, has the Chinese government becoming increasingly concerned because if you look at the way they're expressing their attitude towards macroeconomic policy in the past few months, it is quite clear that increasingly they have turned from somewhat tightening stance to a more so-called neutral stance, however you define it. But the most important uh, indications of this to me is that I don't think credit investment growth is going to continue to fall as they have been so quickly. And I don't think the decline in credit growth is going to continue. Now, if they hold at current levels, which seems to be the implication, just judging from what the central bank is saying and other policymakers as well, uh, we believe that it will more or less keep credit growth in line with income growth, which to us may not be a good thing because at that current levels, that debt is very high, but at least it doesn't cause the situation to worsen. Now, the second thing is, we also don't see the MOF at the moment loosening significantly its reins on local government investment. And that is a big concern because as of today, even without new, new investment and new debt, local governments are struggling to repay, uh, to, to service their debt because of the large amounts of debt that have been cut over the past 10 years. Now, to the extent that this policy stance maintain, is maintained and maybe tightened a bit once conditions improve, I think uh, we are unlikely to make any negative credit rating action on the Chinese sovereign rating. However, uh, I think topmost of all policymakers in China's mind are employment, social stability, and 
they correlate that quite a lot with the OPEC land GDP growth. So if going forward, we do see growth coming down even from 6.5%, which is announced as the first third quarter growth this year, um, towards 55 and even lower. I think there is a very strong likelihood that we can see the deleveraging, the overcapacity targeting uh, measures starting to ease. And, I, and, and that is the uh, concerns that we have. Now, of course, uh, all these are mainly in response to not just headline growth, but also the state of employment. And as of today, I don't think we have too many worries on that front. But clearly, as growth continues to slow, as uncertainties continue to be maintained at this level, I think the risk that policy stance may ease too much for our, uh, in, from our, the point of view of our credit support uh, will increase. And maybe I'll just stop here and let Ryan take over to speak on financial institutions. So, um, right, so just going to pick up from where Kim and Matt off. Let off. Um, earlier, Kim and talked about there are many different indicators uh, looking at the credit growth. And I think if you read the newspaper, you will find that some media may be um, uh, describing the current situation as uh, the Chinese government going back to Plum Prime. Uh, to try to kickstart the economy or to keep the economy from uh, slowing down. Uh, however, we believe uh, if you look at uh, some of the uh, key numbers like the M2, uh, M2 growth, uh, then you will find that actually it's been uh, quite moderate uh, and um, to Kim Ang's point, uh, matching the um, income growth. So from our point of view, uh, the, the leveraging has definitely slowed down but we haven't seen a uh, big U-turn. Now, there are different reads of uh, recent triple R cuts. The 1% cut is um, a lot uh, bigger than what we expect. Uh, our view is that that cut is basically used to um, try to channel funds to uh, sectors that the governments want to channel to, the uh, SMEs, innovative sectors. Um, however, we are not quite sure whether the cut by itself is going to be enough to do that. And uh, actually we believe uh, it will take a lot more uh, to be able to channel the fund to all these uh, sectors. Um, now, uh, recently we have published a report uh, for the 41 uh, listed commercial banks in China. Uh, and uh, there are several things I'd like to highlight and share with you all. Uh, as I mentioned earlier about the deleveraging trend, so I'm not going to uh, go over that again. Uh, the other key point is the change in uh, funding and asset mix. Now, uh, let's look at the deposit growth and the asset growth, and uh, the observer will find that the deposit growth has been lagging, uh, the loan growth and the asset growth um, uh, for some time. Uh, and the use of uh, interbank credit has been on the rise in the past couple of years. And last year, we have seen some uh, government action authorities to uh, try to uh, slow down that growth, uh, try to deleverage the financial sector. And we do see some success in that. However, for doing so, uh, that will push the banking sector to uh, polarize even more, uh, simply because uh, the small banks that are relying on interbank funding will find it really tough under this current situation, while the big, uh, the mega banks, uh, the top four banks um, and, and uh, the postal uh, saving bank, uh, they have a very strong deposit base and they are um, there to, I guess, uh, shall I put it, they, are, they will be responsible for uh, channeling credits uh, to the uh, economy. However, uh, for that to happen though, uh, the key thing is uh, risk and return. Now, whether these banks see the risk and return uh, is there for them to do that, uh, at the moment I think it's uh, still mixed. Uh, some of the banks are very cautious uh, in making <coughs> loans to uh, SMEs, in making loans to private sectors, they still prefer uh, more uh, credits to uh, SOEs because uh, while the government has uh, stated many times that uh, you know, there's no implicit support, uh, but I guess uh, if you talk to any um, Chinese banks, uh, you know, they will always think about uh, you know, whether this company is uh, serving any policy uh, for the government, whether this 
uh, this company is uh, producing uh, goods that uh, the uh, central government wants. Uh, so all those uh, policies continue to influence uh, the bank's underwriting uh, decision. And we do see this uh, going to continue to be a trend and will uh, take some time for that to change. Now on the, um, uh, on the smaller banks, uh, we do see uh, it's very likely that they will become even more aggressive in risk taking simply because of the uh, deposit costs for them uh, will continue to be under pressure and to make the equation works, uh, they will need to um, basically take on riskier uh, exposure. However, there are constraints for them to do so. Uh, many of them, the capital level is relatively uh, tight. Uh, actually, they do not have much room to grow that much more. Uh, especially in the light of uh, several things, uh, the IFRS 9, uh, the regulators uh, push for all the banks to you know, uh, classify their NPL as a more even stringent standard, uh, basically moving all their overdue for over 90 days as NPL. And as our study will show, uh, there's a, quite a few number of banks, uh, if they do it today, uh, their capital level will drop quite substantially uh, and that will basically constrain their growth and some of them will require additional fresh capital uh, to continue to operate. Um, so uh, these are the um, key findings uh, in our report. So I would like to pass it to uh, Chiang. So uh, we all know in this year uh, the biggest uh, credit uh, risk is the liquidity and refinancing risk for Chinese corporations. Um, uh, uh, in terms of the Chinese onshore market, the uh, corporate defaults has reached uh, 63 billion RMB, uh, which is a historical high. Um, and this number uh, will become larger, even larger, because there's still uh, two months ahead. Um, so why the liquidity and the refinancing risk is so big in this year? Um, I think one of the most important things is that the Chinese government has restricted the shadow banking activities of the corporations by implementing uh, strictly a new asset management regulation. Um, <clears throat> so um, because of the liquidity and the financing risk, um, our rated portfolio has more negative rating actions on Chinese corporations um, since the beginning of this year. Uh, which we reverse the improving deliberate trend of our rating portfolio. And uh, um, going forward, we think the liquidity and refinancing risk will remain a big problem for Chinese corporations, uh, partly due to the large amount of the above maturity in the next uh, two, two to three years, uh, both on, on short onshore market and offshore market. Um, especially on onshore market, um, the crypto bank has added the additional pressure for Chinese corporations because uh, there will be one trading RMB, a crypto bank can be put back to issuers in this year, and uh, uh, there will be 1.6 trading RMB next year. So um, that will uh, add huge pressure for Chinese corporations to uh, repay their debt. Um, uh, additionally, um, uh, in addition to the refinance risk, we uh, we found uh, we have found that the uh, slower earning growth would be uh, next uh, credit concern for our rich portfolio. Um, yeah, as the king said, the uh, Chinese economy growth has um, uh, has seen some you know negative um, growth momentum in terms of export, in terms of the uh, fixed asset investment. Uh, so uh, all this is pointing to a slower earning growth for Chinese corporations in the future. Um, based, on, based on our estimation, uh, our rich portfolio's EBITDA growth uh, will be 10% uh, on average this year, uh, much slower than 25% last year. So um, we think the slower uh, earning growth will uh, drag down our portfolio's uh, uh, delivery trends. Since 2015. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, the ongoing the refinancing risk and uh, uh, 
this lower uh, early growth, we will become the uh, more and more greatly con with concern for, me, for us to uh, uh, to say on our uh, the portfolio. So I will stop here. Um, thank you.